Hello, everyone, and welcome to season two of BeagleCast, episode one. Today we have Cyril from Microchip and talk about Beagle v Fire and much more. Welcome, everyone. Cyril, how about you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Cyril. I work for Microchip Technology. I actually work in the FPGA business unit. So that's what I do during the day. And at the weekend, I do play with bigger boards. So I've been playing with the, the Beagle 5 Fire for quite a while now. And we're starting to see uh, these being pushed to the, the repos and becoming quite quite usable, I think. So anything else you'd like to know about? So one of the things that we've been doing and like that we are just chatting about with, with Robert there is the ability to build gateway using the CI system. So maybe, Robert, do you want to expand a little bit on that, the latest things that you've done there? So yeah, this is a kind of a project Jason and I have been working on for like the last couple of years. We have a GitLab instance, and we're also trying to make personal like uh, Ubuntu calls them PPAs, personal private repos or something like that. So with the gateway repo, any user can fork that repo and we got it up on the screen here. And if you push your own design into your own repo, not only will build the custom gateware for your design, it all, the CI will also create a Debian repo so you can actually have a fleet of devices and you can apt update to your design if you want to. But at the same time, you can also push back the changes to the main repo. But yeah, this gives us the ability that, let's say you you are working on some custom, you have 100 CNC printers maybe out in the field, and you want to maintain them and push them. You can use our base Ubuntu image, use the PPBA, push your gateway changes, and then all your devices will always be up to date with the latest FPGA firmware. Yeah, and that's, that's something that's actually quite impressive from my point of view. So the, um, the Big Old Fire Fire is built around the Polifire SOC, SOC FPGA. So when people hear SOC FPGA, they think FPGA, they think, you know, big, long, complicated development tools and getting license for EDA tools and all that, uh, all that somewhat annoying stuff if you want to do projects for, for fun. So this removes the, the need to install the, the FPGA tools on your machine. And the way it, it's very interesting to see the way Rob, the way Robert speaks about like the flow there on what I actually experienced during the week. Most people think of Polo 5 SOC as an FPGA. Therefore, like when the announcement for the Big Old Five Fire was made using the Polo 5 SOC, everybody was thinking FPGA. But that's where people start running into difficulties. Like they go down the FPGA route, but like Polo 5 SOC is really an application processor. On one of its peripherals, uh, you can think of it as a very fancy GPIO controller and that can reprogram it to, uh, to do things that your other controllers on the device cannot do. Um, when you start thinking that way, then all the stuff that Robert has been talking about makes perfect sense. Like you're using an application process processor, you're using the, an upgate, using scripts on running Linux on the board to do your update of the FPGA part of the device, and the rest of it is fairly quite familiar to use, or like it, there's not much not, not much strange about how complicated about the device. But like if you take the approach the other way around and start thinking, okay, so this is an FPGA, so I'm going to start by building an FPGA design for that board, and then I'm going to try to shoehorn the software on top of that FPGA design, that's where life becomes difficult. So like taking the reverse approach, software first, that makes life a lot easier, surprisingly easier. Uh, exactly. When working with FPGAs. <laughs> that's what we love about yeah, the Gateware project. Kind of the, Go ahead, Jason. It is what we love about the Gateware project because you've already got something that works and we could just kind of fork it and start adding our own little gates. And I think that's kind of way the way we think about things with, with, with Beagle as a whole, right? So you, know, you start with the working Linux system and then you start decomposing it and building other things out of it, right? Here we have something really magical with FPGA fabric that we can go and, and, and do some things with. So I was just going to randomly try to do a, a hello world, but you know, it's always the silly little things that get in your way. I think that en enabling a fork is probably the, one of the easier things that we can fix. But uh, I too, it's like that should have worked. I'm wondering why it didn't. I don't know if there was a permission issue, but yeah, on the side, uh, I think I might already have that. migration. My, my first, that was my first thought is that I've already forked it. Yeah, the other issue is we upgraded GitLab last night, so. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, any registered yeah. user on our Git repo can basically fork that repo, push their changes. They don't have to install any of the liberal tools. You get basically two CI of VMs running. Um, they're both eight cores, 32 gigs of RAM, Ubuntu installs, all the help of serial. Like, what do we need to install? So they just run. 
they build the gateway and they shove out a deb at the end. So, and it does and, not actually take that long to actually run through the CI, and that's something that was quite interesting to see as well. Using the tools locally versus using the CI, it runs at the same speed, and like it's so like the, there's limited advantages to installing the tools on your machine unless you get yourself in trouble or you need to start debugging. But you should not actually. That, that's one of the thing about like FPGAs. You should try to never do your debugging on the board. You do your debugging in simulation. And like, that's where like we have some plans for better documentation to actually explain all those steps of the flow and so that like make it easier. So Jason was talking about um, Hello World. So there is one, yeah, there's one document that was pushed recently, or I think is on its way to the, the documentation, some very log template that was added to the, the gateway and explanation as to how you take that template make a few changes in Verilog, and like it's pure Verilog. So like for learning Verilog as a student, like it's a good, good approach. And like there's a lot of material that exists on the web and there's some interesting courses that would be pointing out. That basically like does the, the FPGA equivalent of Hello World, which is Blink on LED. So that takes you through those few steps using the, the CI. Yeah, actually that's the last one on the, the list there. Customize. So if you run through these steps, that will sh should allow you to use the, the CI system. And that explains how you actually go take a copy of the template of the, the Cape Gateway template. So which is the some Verilog code that deals with anything that's attached to the, the Cape connectors. And then make some very simple changes there that will hijack one of the user LEDs and blink it. So, so the, yeah, so like the lot of renaming like you copy, rename a few things, and then once you're done with the, the tickle script, then you are in a very log world, which is fairly standard to use. So like it's it's a nice way to learn how to write very log, how to how to do gateway. So there's one big step that's missing there is the Yeah, I found that there's a, there's a bunch of nice online tools for learning Verilog. Like and that might be some useful way to kind of get some initial initialized. Like there's some online tools. I'm trying to remember the names of them, but you can actually mm -hmm. run simulations online in your web browser, right? To simulate yeah. something like this, um, kind of like uh, what you like at JS Fiddle. If you've ever done websites, or I'm trying to remember which tools. Do you remember the names? Because we should really put a link here. Yeah, so like the, there is a, for the first time. Um, yeah. So like the, there's one aspect is learning Verilog and the other aspect is doing verification of your Verilog. So there is, I've been looking around at the, the existing courses and there's one from, like, okay, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name because I probably won't get it. Basically like the guy who wrote the, the Zip CPU, he has a very good course, like set of slides and you take them through. And if you take those slides in parallel with this, it will actually take you further from you know, from just blinking the LED, like it will try to different different patterns, and you know, go a little bit further from that, starting from that little example. But more importantly, it explains how to use Verilog to do to use C plus plus to write a test bench for your Verilog, and that's really the key the key thing that's not yet in that documentation is how and in the Verilog, in the Verilog template is the C plus plus test bench template. Yeah, C++, so like, or I mean, a lot of people just do it with, um, you know, system Verilog these days, right? I mean, you could do it with yeah, C++, yeah, or you system, could do Verilog, system Verilog for your... Yeah, yeah, the, yeah so like it, there's many ways to do to do it. So the nice way about C++ is that it's, it's already more than likely already on your machine. So the one thing that wasn't super clear from what I, you guys um, explained is, so does the Debian package actually, you know, so it, it contains the Verilog, how does it actually deploy to the FPGA? Does it just, is it a callable function within Linux afterwards to, to actually just, and it just runs in the background or how does it? So we, the Debian package only has the updated firmware and the flashing script. So Microchip has written, there's a Linux driver that we use where we move the firmware into the right spot. We hit a certain magic area under sys. It'll actually program the FPGA and then reboot. So there's always going to be a reboot involved. But yeah, so all the dev packages just have the firmware stuff and it's up to the end user to run the Beagle version command, see what yeah. version of the firmware they've loaded onto the FPGA and then compare what they download it. And if it's diff, they can update it and then essentially reboot. Okay. So yeah, it's, I don't know, has it gotten the mainline yet? I know So Connor's working on it. But yeah, so Connor has done, so like the version that we have is 
actually not Connor's first version because the first version was risky. We actually managed to break a few boards using that approach. So this is the second approach, which works quite well, but like it's still a little bit messy. So now it's currently, well, it's not that I think he's actually as it re- rewritten and he's going to be resubmitting the drivers for it into mainline. Um, That's awesome. But, yeah, so like we, we have, Connor has had some difficulties with that code in getting it into mainline because the the Polo Fire SOC FPGA is a flash FPGA, so it doesn't really follow the model of the other guys, which are SRAM based. So we don't fit in the in the standard FPGA manager approach of doing things. So like we kind of did something else that that will be even cleaner from a point of view like f- from a user point of view like we'll just update the script the script will just use a different approach so like this this set of instructions will remain the same regardless of the the switch of fpga programming details in the in the linux corner and then we got it because of our design of this soic this uh, polar fire we got to be a little careful too because in that feaj firmware it's also the hss if i'm correct right and then yeah. all the details for how the, the risk 5 core complex actually talks to everything so if you miss flash it well you've soft bricked it so you can re it yeah so, so it's extra yeah. careful <laughs> yeah so that's one of the things that the the gateway build system is uh, it's building that interaction to, to to actually not get yourself into that situation yeah yep. and like but you you will be able to break the ball well it you will not it's like soft brick it, soft brick yeah it's soft brick like he, you know you have to be very creative to to break the the board you can actually get the board if i remember correctly yeah we do still have that stuff but you can actually get the board to self-destruct if you really want to but like those features like on you know with those macros in the fpgas i've never i've made the conscious decision of not using them so that you know it's pretty safe to go modify the the gateway without really so you you shouldn't really be able to really break the board like you really have to go be very very creative and Probably we start doing a, a gateway from scratch to, uh, to bring the board. And that's where Connor's driver is so important. I know a lot of other FPGAs, they usually bring up the arm first and then the arm loads the FPGA. In this case, it's like the FPGA and the, it's everything. So it's like, yeah, the, the firmware updater has to be very special. Very. Hmm. So I have managed to solve break myself recently. So there's really one... Okay, the easy way to solve break yourself is... To mess up the, the device three overlays and the one thing to do is to include the pci express block in your device three overlay and not actually include it in the gateway uh, at linux when it boots up it looks goes looking for the pci express block and it goes into la la land and at that point we can't get back you to can, linux and it comes. and to be fair we can do that, that in a our... serial cable you can you can fix that from a serial cable in the U-boot prompt. You can actually avoid that from so with just a serial cable. You don't need to redo yeah. the the yeah, yeah, flash yeah. on the SPI. Yeah. Um, so like, in order to boot yeah. from that sort of yeah. uh, overlay can issue because you can change what the overlays are at the U-boot command line. So that one requires a serial loader. Only when you've done really nasty things, you need to go and get something like the the flash pro five and the the tag connect. Yeah. And then even then, you can you don't need the flash pro five if you use the people on black with right. a We've direct got, c cable yeah direct c we got in in the in in the the, the beagle beagle v fire right now we've got it's so we've the got middle there the, direct c. Yeah, yeah so it's in the direct yeah. that direct c stuff is something that has existed for years like for more than 15 years it's been used very little but you know but it's actually extremely extremely useful in in the case of the the beagle five fire or actually any other. Using this software, you can program a microchip FVGA from nearly anything. Mm-hmm. And also, if you don't, and that, that's a question that came around the forums, is that if you don't have a Flash Pro 5, there's also that very small device that you can't get from Trends, which is a clone embedded Flash Pro 5, which works fine. That's awesome. So that, uh, that's another approach. So, so when you look, at the the cable like it's you can hardly see it compared with a flash for five like when you pl- plug it into the cable so there, there's different options you know when you want to go yeah. into the into that world yeah the most expensive part of it ends up being the uh, tag connect uh, yeah the tag connect cable is the most expensive part yeah. uh, 
But if, if, if you're willing to go that hacker at that point, you can also just slaughter to the test pads and... Yeah, but like, you know, like when you look at the price of it overall, like it's, if you want to use the tag connect, you, or if, okay, so if you want to use the tag connect, there's, if you're using Linux, you probably should never need to have to use it. Yeah. If you're doing some bare metal or if, you, if you're hacking with Artos directly, um, then it does make sense to have the JTAG port. If you want to do some fancy FPGA debug, then you use the tag connect, like for example, like generating the eyes for the, the service. That's where you need the, the JTAG port. But like most of the time, you you should not need it. So like just with the board, you're good. Like yeah, yeah. you can get a lot done. If you're a broke college student trying to you know fix your soft brick FPGA, you know just bust out the soldering <laughs> iron, bust out your Vega Boom Black, and or you know borrow borrow a cable from a professor. Borrow the cable from the professor. Get the professors to uh, give the yeah. We, maybe we should give every professor a free, a free cable and have that problem sorted. That's possible. We can, yeah, for, for, if there's a professor listening to this, we will ship you cables. That sounds like a good use of... Uh, so I, I just wanted to share this. Um, this is a taking blink code and a kind of quick and dirty test match in system bear log. Right. And right now, this one's not graphical. I'm sure there's some other out there that will like do nice graphical. This one here is just searching for the eggs and printing pulse. Right. But this will this will compile your Verilog code and test that. OK, so it'll compile your Verilog code and then... You might have to repeat that, Jason. You're breaking up a bit there. So the EDA playground is pretty nice because you can just run here. The It'll compile your Verilog code and then run the system Verilog test match. You can see here it's what detected the pulses, right? It's on the blinky LED. So I think it's a handy one. Is this usually just like open source, like iVerilog? Or you know what's behind the scenes on EDA program background playground? Well, it looks like it's brought to you by Duolo, so we could probably ask them. Cyril, do you know a better, like, like I know we could use Libero to do the simulation. Wow. Yeah, no, I'm, like, you know, well, I'm looking for as much open and yeah, easy and free. Yeah. And, yeah, so like there, there's a couple of those. Uh, I mean, I think Libero is free as well, but it, you know, it's yeah, yeah, not... Libero is free. And like, but uh, okay, you can use Libero and you can go create some test benches that will make use of, of Questa Sim. That's a perfectly valid way of, of doing your test bench. Like, everybody has kind of their preference. I really like using very later. That I found that for me that works very well. That does what I'm looking for. So like I'm basically like writing my test bench in C++ and I can write something that will generate traffic or something that will observe the output of my of my circuit, write checkers in C++. So like a kind of anal analyze protocols and you know write some analysis in c++ whereas like i would not know where to start how to do that in questa sim but then again my background is not digital design so like somebody who's has a digital design background will run to libero will be very comfortable using this but for somebody with a software background i think very later well very later works for me as somebody with a software background and like since like we're trying to to say that hey this is not an FPGA, so we should have a, a big bunch of software people who are using the, these boards and have them in their comfort zone with C++. But like, there's many ways to, to do things. So like, there's so there's the very later, but like, there's also something that I find very interesting and very valuable from the point of view of verification is formal methods. And for this, Yosis does have some features there. Like, so like you probably. You know, if I was doing this professionally, I'd probably be using a mix of the two, of uh, Relator and Yosis. Use Yosis uh, or Symbiosis for the the formal verification aspect of it, and then Relator for for like the simple protocols, for like the functional tests. But here again, like there's some it's people. Symbiosis? Who to me. Is that the one you're talking Sorry? about? Symbiosis. You're symbiosis. talking about Symbiosis. Yeah. Yep. So the. Okay, so these tools can be used for synthesis, but for me, where the well, for 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 me, the real benefit of that tool chain is the formal verification, like the the synthesis. Well, okay, yeah, it, synthesis can be done with the liberal tools, the the supplied tools that works fine and it's quite efficient. But and you could probably use this for synthesis on Podify SOC. That'd be interesting to 
try out to see how far you go. But for, for me, like it's the, the added feature, like beyond the synthesis. It's it's the formal method. Here again, okay. the I can't remember this name. Like if you look up Zip CPU, I do believe that he also has some introduction to formal methods. Uh, which could be interesting for What's people CPU, to learn about. CPU, what did you say? So, yeah, Zip CPU. I'm happy to let you share. I'll turn mine off. Yeah, go zipcpu.com. Yep. They don't, yep. Uh, somebody needs to teach them about HTTPS and let's encrypt. Dot, let's, and let's encrypt. So, the yeah, so if you go into the tutorials, you can actually okay. run through the entire tutorial there. Like uh, if you want to learn Verilog, the whole to do test benches, like it's it's a very good, like that. that's one of the nice. the best free resource that I've come across to learn Verilog very later on formal verification. That's a very good, a very good start. Excellent. So there's a lot of material that's available online that uh, that can be used. And this is one of the, this is a good one. I think what a lot of people would be interested in doing with the, the, the Beagle 5 Fire is like taking very small risk 5 cores and getting some extra visibility inside them, simulating them, right? But getting something mm-hmm. that goes fast yep. enough, right? So you can do the offline yeah. simulation, right? But but you want to run it in that PGA fabric to get something that's able to run and then like connect up to outside hardware, but at the same time have this Linux system that can go in and, and, and monitor that, right? So the thing, one thing I'd like to kind of uh, spearhead is kind of bringing people together to kind of put that, you know, kind of tutorial system together where you can have a system synthesize some tiny stimulate that with different um, IO right maybe do some um, some things like what we had with the PRU so you had some directly IO mapped bits in the in the in some of the registers and then you'll build out some some <clears throat> additional visibility from the Linux side right so that you can look at you know the, the memory that's accessible to that risk core the <clears throat> what you know look at all the registers right and, you know we, we have a lot of that with kind of stop mode debug right but and i'm sorry and um, um with jtag but you have you know when you're, we're typically doing linux debug we're looking at doing you know runtime debuggers like gdb you know things that like do mm-hmm. software trap based debugging right so you replace mm-hmm. the instructions with things to 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 go into the software and then and then you go and look at the registers but you know, i think it gets it gets kind of interesting when you've got the ability to kind of instantiate a cpu that you're not kind of limited to just jtag scan to kind of get the access to all the internals and jason that reminds me um, we got to submit a, a core score to olaf so oh how yeah risk, how many risk five cores can we run on the beagle v a fire while still doing normal stuff yeah, that's a great point. Because I, I know the uh, so we'll have to... icicle is on there at uh, 882 core score, and a lot of our FPJ fabric is is kind of being utilized. But yeah, ah uh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So core score dot store has the whole list. So Olaf, one of the designers of a lot of the RISC five CPUs, put this out, and yeah, I believe he yeah he has a he board. Did a very so. tiny. All right, he is one of the tiniest cores, right? So yep. Yeah, if you go we scroll down and go to the course, we can put on a Beagle Five Fire. Yep. And what I like to do is when we do that, we should have each core doing like a pair of pins or a single pin, and so that way we do some really fun IO. But yeah, Polar Fire eight hundred eighty two risk five cores. So we're a little bit smaller than the Polar Fire eval, so it'll probably be. Oh yeah, more. so that yeah, the Polar Fire eval kit, if I remember, is three hundred. So three hundred parts. So yeah. So. We're so we should be that. 10 times less. That's still 80 cores. Yeah, still like 80 cores. Yeah, so like, you know, you know, still 80 IOs to play with, with some interesting stuff. So in the in the bottom of the yellow range is where we guess we're going to be? Yep, because we're the, we're the smallest of the, the polar fires. And we have a lot of stuff being taken up already. So fun. Because uh, I assume that we run this score that we're still running Linux and we're still talking to it. So it still has to boot up Debian. Although that doesn't take a lot of gateway resources necessarily. There's some of it, but like most, a lot of it's in the, the hard, hard, hard wire portions, right? So, I mean, there's definitely some resources used in the routing, right? But I mean, I don't know how much of that is like, you know, if you look at, at something, what's it's the MSS? I, I forget the H. I, I get confused by some of the yeah. acronyms. The MSS, there's the HSS, there's, yeah, so like the MSS. But the MPU the... subsystem and the, so there's the heart system services. Is that, that's HSS? Yeah. So DHSS then, uh, part of routine is like your zero stage bootloader plus you know that that's really the the code the the first piece of code that executes on the the processor. Actually, that's another small weird 
point is because of the flash the, that we have on this device, we do not have a boot RAM for the, the application processors. So you can, like DHSS is the, the first piece of, of code running on these on this application com complex. So like if you want to do your own flavor of bootloader, like it's, it's an interesting platform to uh, to play with. Yeah, so like that's the HSS, hard software services. The MSS is the microprocessor subsystem. So like that's all of the, the ASIC blocks. So that's that's the the five 64-bit 3.5 processors, the peripherals, your Ethernet, your USB, all that stuff. And then the, the rest of it is FPGA. Yeah, because I don't think I don't think we need a whole lot of the fabric. We have to do some configuration of the HSS and the MSS, but I don't think we eat up a lot of the fabric just to get our system to boot right. So I think that the it's a hard controller, um, yeah, for the EMM, EMMC, right? So that's coming out of the MSS. That's really not coming out of the the the, the logic fabric, right? So yeah, and like you, you can. Okay, so in theory, I'm not sure if it's really that useful. You can, like, well, yes, you, you can build some systems that make sense. You, you can start up the, you can use the MSS, you can use the RIS-5 without having anything in the FPG. And I ran into a question from one of my colleagues, like, Rick, like we're looking at the reset structure of the device, and we kind of come to the conclusion that yes it's you know it has its own clock inputs and like it's it generates its own clocks its own resets so the the processors can start on their own without uh, the need for anything in the FEGA. If i remember correctly that was one of the the requirements for that device that makes sense i mean not that it'd be strictly required for all use cases but like having it have, have that flexibility all right you know there, there are so many useful hardware peripherals being able to just use those hard hard peripherals rather than the than the fabric right and i, I think I what think we're trying to useful get from this too is we're thinking like so when i say pru in this case i'm actually meaning risk 32 but so in the beagle bone family we've always had devices with pru's and you have only a certain number of pins in certain number of pru's with this board we could make unlimited pru's for like every two or three pins each has its own dedicated little cpu and i think a lot of people would see that as a uh, really nice way to do real-time io pretty much on anything and the you know question is how big does each risk 32 have to be how many how many io pins does each need what else do we need to add and yeah so th that's when we have been you know that it was yeah the PIO approach is is a good approach in general. Like with the FPGA, we'll probably find that for some of the stuff that the PIO would be doing, if you actually did a very long design, uh, like a very small block, you'd probably do fulfill your function with a smaller part of the the FPGA of the, the little. But yeah, like you're, you're right. Like on the big old board, like if you're seriously taking PRU and if PRUs are not a problem for you, but like, you know, you need more, you need something slightly different. One way to think about the big old five fire is that the, the difference is that there's some a different kind of PRU mm -hmm. on, the, on the system. And those, the ways like some people use the bigger board without going anywhere in the, the PRUs, you can use the big old five fire without going very much near the the FPGA. Like you can use the the pre can designs that we provide to that, or you can go deeper down the, the FPGA route. So it's yeah, you know, it's different way of solve, solving a problem. You know, down to what your preferences. Yep. And I think all we're looking for is like a you know a simple RISC 32 core that is really fast I/O essentially. So yeah. like it's PRU like, but no, it's like take a RISC 32 core, throw it like eight of the io and then have 12 of them on the risk on the beagle v fire i'm going to use that as an opportunity to switch directions a little bit and plug <laughs> gsoc because yeah. it's it's yeah. time it, it you know our the we can start beginning to <clears throat> submit our organization applications this month right so it's time to put put together our case for why you know beagle should be a, a mentoring organization for for 24 and then we, what we really, this is perfect for ideas, right? I think we're trying to move away from using the eLinux wiki, um, but we really haven't made that that transition. I think it's worthwhile to figure out how much of it do we want to put on OpenBeagle, which is our GitLab server, and how much of it we want to put on the forum. But uh, essentially, I think we're going to be moving everything to one of those two places, either to our forum or the the. Our, our GitLab, right? The open open Beagle server. 
I'm losing Andre is always scary because he's the guy recording all this. So, oh, oh yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if there's any feedback there. Are we are we going to move everything one way or the other? But we'll be working that out, you know, in the chat and in the forum over the next week or two to try to you know make sure that our guidelines are really clear, right? I think the the ideas template is largely going to be the same, right? But you know maybe we move that into to to, to open Beagle. I think the biggest thing and, is this is the first year at GSOC where we have an FPGA design that people can utilize too. I mean, last year we were close, like you know, depending on how things go, but it yeah. kind of brings an unlimited number of possibilities for students to work on. It's like, what do you want to? Yeah, and yeah, we had some you know some added as capes in the past, right? But like we have. We actually did some legwork on the whole idea of implementing a PRU, right? Which by that, I just mean a CPU with IO mapped to register bits, right? So directly into the register bits. And I think that that would be one of the, the, the first proposals I'd like to look at. But I think also if we look at a bigger project, so maybe something that, that, that does a, a deeper um, visibility to a RISC-V core, right? And they're not just... Not just getting the pure U bits going, but something that's a little bit more of a of a CPU building tutorial, and just overall improving that developer experience to to get started doing you know Verilog, you know, quick and easy. People, I think that be, because we have a working Linux system that people can just start from and just start forking designs without doing CI, and I mean, without, but just using CI without having to install a lot of tools, right, opens up a lot of possibilities for making this a lot lower barriers to entry. And you're not you're not IO or throughput limited this time, right? Compared to a cape or something like that. So you you have that fabric. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, because you've got access direct access to the the DDR, and then you've got the PCI Express and the extra thirties lanes. It's worth talking about the 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 work that Charles Steinkohler started, right? So the all right, Robert, what that what's that called? The the Sig Ziggy KiCad. You're muted. Yeah, I can never figure out how um, to pronounce it. Zig Ziggy or yeah, but Charles posted the forum. He's been working on interface board between the Beagle Fire and Oh, you got it up. Yep. So yeah, here's an awesome project. Zig Ziggy's KaiCad. And he's also sent boards to Osh Park so you, people can buy them now. I don't is there a picture uh, of I don't, I don't, if you click the audio rendering. Sure. Yep. Yeah, click the Osh Park link. Otherwise, oh, did he give an Osh Park link? Yep. Yeah, it's a lot. Is this dude previewing of STP? No. Uh you gotta use the there's a KaiCad viewer that one of the developers writ. Kate Kai Genvis should work on it. Oh yeah, or just bring oh, this. Oh nice, up. there we go. That's what I wanted. That's exactly what I wanted. So this is the the Sig Ziggy connector, and the with and now you've got mounting holes that are more aligned with the the Beagle Five Fire, right? So and he has the know, communication set, three thirties lanes. What do we have on, on the? We have uh, we have three three separate thirties right going to the the Sig Ziggy. Is that right, Cyril? If you remember. Yes. So there are three thirties brought into the. So I think it's. I've heard people pronounce it Ziggy. Actually, I'll give up on the pronunciation as well. Like, so yeah, so there's three thirds lane that brought to the to the header. So there is one caveat is that if you're using PCI Express, so if you are using like a Wi-Fi module on the M.2 connector, you can only use two of the thirds lanes. So there is something like so if you want to use the all three thirds lanes, all three transceivers for these boards, for this interface, you need to disable the PCI Express block from the, the gateway. So like it's a, it's a little quirk of the PCI Express on the, the way the, the transceivers are organized. I'm pretty sure Charles wants to use that. That's why he just brought out the two in this design. Mm, yeah, it's pretty so cool. Did he only bring uh, out two? Or yeah, just Is that the case only you only brought out two? That's only why there's one pair on this image. I think it's pronounced as CZG, uh, which actually means a pair of connected or corresponding things. Maybe how we are using like a lot of certis pair or something like that. So that's why so they chose this. What's the CCG. what's the intent for it for doing SDI? Is he trying to do video output or because only SDI is a video standard, right? Yes. So we would have to ask Charles. The forum post, yeah. So analog video being seen? I think SDI is digital. Oh is that like a I won't look it up. It's like a broadcasting I think it's using broadcasting normally. Yeah, I think it's used in professional video uh, systems. So he might have he might have a use case there. I guess uh, copy copy stuff out of frame buffer, output it, copy it back into RAM. Maybe DIY capture card. Yeah. So I okay. So I've seen some people do interesting stuff with this. So 
For example, when you're watching, uh, okay, you guys will be different, watching probably different sports. Let's say you're watching football and you see a line appearing on the pitch to show like which way the players are aligned and that's done in real time. So I suspect that that video goes through an SDI interface into an FPGA that then overlays some video real time onto before it goes back to the broadcast. So that, you know, those type of applications of professional video of real time manipulation and overlaying of, of uh, information on, on the video before it goes straight into the broadcast. Yeah. It seems there's pretty affordable HDMI to SDI converters, right? So for 40 bucks, you can get an HDMI to SDI converter. But like the SDI it must be used in more professional situations, like you're talking about, right? Where you're, you're you know, doing live video editing with hardware. I think the retention seems to be one of the quoted benefits to it. The fact that you have a, a, a screw cap on there so that people don't you know, if it's absolutely required, you're not bumping into the cable and disconnecting it over HDMI. I'm not sure what else is really better about SDI. Explains to me why I don't know that much about it because I'm not that much into broadcast video. But that seems like a so this this board sounds like it could do some some cool demos. Yeah. So I've come across a couple of other boards. Uh, I think Jason, you got a couple of boards and I, where did I see that? So, so like there, there, there's a few boards that for A2D converters, high-speed A2D converters on D2A. So like there, there seems to be a few options there. And I've come, yes, yes, that type of stuff. So I've come across something that was less than $100 for A2D D2A somewhere. Um, so using, using Syzygy? Or yes. Just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, using Syzygy. So yeah, I can't remember what's in it, but yeah, like on if you yeah do a search, probably come across it on one of those uh, popular electronics uh, sites. So yeah, so like the that that interface is quite quite interesting. So I was not familiar with it before the the bigger five fire. I suspect it's fairly recent, but yeah, that does open a lot of opportunities to like I'm thinking like software radios or things like that, where like it's one. Can probably do some very interesting stuff. That that could be another really interesting area for the GSOC stuff, right? So how can we, you know, do some tighter integration with stuff like GNU Radio? You know, some um, you know, are there certain pieces that we can put together for folks? You know, to to give them a platform for doing software defined radio a little bit cleaner. I think that's something that is worth some project proposals, right? So this is continue to call for, for people who are interested in mentoring really high quality students. We get some really great students every year, you know, high quality universities and and right if a lot of them are master students with some really great backgrounds, right? So we really get great students and want to encourage mentors to kind of get their ideas out there now so that we can present them to track the right students and make the coolest projects right that where people could, and, and i would remind would-be mentors it's not about doing the work for you it's about you know creating reusable code for the open source software community and not to encourage kids to do cool what i did over my summer vacation projects it's to actually make reusable open source software right that that's the end goal right i think people come with these crazy ideas of things that would be really su super cool demos but a demo is not a reusable software component that people will you know continue to support and, and live and, and moves open source software forward but we've had some really cool stuff you know i i keep looking at all the stuff that that, that came out of the work to put rg pilot on linux right i think you know that continues to just grow and grow and grow. And that started as a Beagle Google Summer of Code project. All right, too much me. So I guess, Cyril, while we have you, any fun projects you've been working on? Because you've, you've kind of teased that you've been you've been doing some some fun kind of things on your own time. And I'm just, just curious. Oh, uh, yeah. So, like OK. So I do like CNC machines of different kinds and uh, type of stuff. But what I'm really big into is uh, model railways. There is actually a protocol for controlling model railways. Uh, I have, you know, a fairly decent setup, but yet I'd like to, to do something slightly different. And actually, it's uh, funny because the reason I got involved with this was for that project because I, I could never find the board that I that would fulfill my requirements. A little bit of FPGA, a processor, reasonably priced, available forever. So that's why I 
got involved in the Beagle Five Fires is just purely for me to get some of those balls to do some of those projects. And like the, the model railway control is one that I will get back to, but there's quite a lot of documentation that I need to put in shape and give to Deepak. A little bit more CI work that needs to be done with Robert. And but like eventually that this is where I, you know, this is where I want to go to with that board. And that's only one project, like, but like, that's the more, like, that, that's one that I would put reasonably achievable given the amount of time that I have to, and that could be useful well, for it as well. And, and you could probably do a lot of it, but if there's the reusable building blocks, right, getting protocols yep. down, yeah. these yeah. also I, make really good Google Summer of Code projects, right? Yeah. You know, building yeah. out, I'm, I'm sure there's a ton of, of management software out there, you know, integration with with Ross and and doing the visualizers, oh, yeah, yeah. right? So the people yeah. can do quick track builders and 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 simulators, path planning, right? There's tons of real time problems to solve. Yeah, Ross is also one topic of interest for me. But like, there's not enough time. That's the problem. Well, Ross, time well, that, but that's that is why you mentor somebody yeah, and yeah. who has more time than you have, but could very much benefit from your expertise, yeah. right? So you spend, you know, maybe, an, you know, dedicate an hour, you know, or, or, or hour three a week, right? And if you can get three hours a week and they can put in 40, yeah. um, you can get a lot done that way. And the open source world will thank you for it. And the nice thing about Ross is there's a lot of educators working on it. I'm pretty sure they have students that are. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's people working yeah. on it. It's, it's just more like because Ross is so big and massive. That's where the problem is. Mm. Yeah, somebody still has to. I haven't spent much time with with Ross too. Right. I mean, Ross is as big because it's got a whole bunch of different blocks. But I still I still get a little bit lost on the, the simulator. I think is really cool. Like that's one of the things that I I really like out of out of Ross. But overall, it's uh, like the the original Ross. It just seem to be very focused on how do I get people that don't know proper code structure and and how mm -hmm. to design code properly to isolate the different responsibilities of of a job and create message passing so that I can do appropriate scheduling in the different scenarios and yeah it's just about all of message passing architecture and and writing isolated structured code it's like did I really need to, Ross to do that? Well, I guess it's just about who you're collaborating with because you're talking to a whole bunch of people that don't know how to do that. And this also brings up the question, is Ross, the add RIS 5 is a supported architecture yet? Because they are in the ARM in ARM64 world, but... Actually, yeah, the, oh. that is the... Uh, no, yeah, no, you, you can run Ross on 5. Yeah, yep. they're, 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 somebody has done it, yeah. Because one, one of the things they have is they have their own package repo too where they build everything and it's it's easier if you use that than try to rebuild everything. So uh -huh. it's it's nice when they officially support an architecture. So like well, either, the, I mean, whether or not they officially support the architecture, they do officially support the operating system and that's going to mean a whole lot of less software dependencies to worry about, right? Because mm -hmm. it's on Ubuntu and guess what? We're on Ubuntu. So mm -hmm. you'll have the dependencies covered. Yeah, because we ran this in the problem of the ARM world. On ARM32, they're, they only officially supported Ubuntu, so we always had a special Ubuntu image just for the old Beagles. Well, this will let you run Ross, because mm. you didn't want to try to run it on Debian. Uh, let's see, target platforms. I, I need to go through the, the review notes and see if RISC-5 is now officially supported architecture, or it's been 2020, hasn't been updated, so maybe it's still ongoing. Yeah, because we ship Ubuntu out of the box, so as soon as Ross officially supports RISC-5, then it should work. It should be unstoppable. Yeah, could be an interesting weekend project for somebody. Just, I'm finding a bunch of scholarly articles about this. So. Good, good, good GSOC stuff. Well, I think we are around time anyway. So, Jason, Indeed. do you still have other topics or are you planning to do you want to? There's a couple things I want to plug, right? Which is the we did a webinar on Beagle 5, which I think the biggest thing that came out of that was a set of flashing instructions and, and particularly like, like kind of how to reflash the Beagle 5 ahead and the Beagle 5 fire, right? So I kind of walk through the processes of like, you know, flashing an operating system onto each, right? Getting them into the bootloader, getting them into the place where you could flash them. So those, those webinars, and I'm, I'm sure we'll link in the show notes somewhere, but those are on the element 14. Yeah. stuff. So, and then what other things I want to make sure we didn't get out of here with, oh, Andre, I, I hear you've got some Zigbee stuff running in your house. Is that right? Yep. I have I have motorized blinds integrated into Home Assistant with a Beagle Play that's been running for, I think, four months now. Nice and stable. 
it's actually in the craft room behind me so we'll, we'll we'll talk about that soon there's a there's a tutorial series a kind of page that explains how to do it there's a ZNP firmware you can flash on the Beagle Play CC1352 so you don't actually need any external hardware beyond your actual Zigbee accessories and they all mesh together more or less reliably the stuff that doesn't work is more Zigbee's fault than the play but yeah it's it's cool it's been reliable they they work pretty great and it's fun because you can get them at Ikea so it's you know they're pretty easy to get if there's an Ikea nearby or yeah just get these these blinds that are all on their own I, I still need to do some fun automations like you know based on you know the time of day I still want to have one blind go on one blind go off just so that the sun doesn't blind me kind of what Robert's dealing with right now but it's the only chance for vitamin yeah. D right now, so I'll take it. We'll we'll talk about that more in a future one, I think, and maybe we should do a video on it because that's that, that's a fun one. All right, so maybe we'll, in the future we'll talk sp all about uh, Home Assistant and Zigbee. That sounds cool. Yeah, with your with your Buildroot integration, that's going to be even even better. Yeah, I mean, the the Buildroot stuff, right? I was able to just go and easily build the mainline kernel. Right, so now I'm just waiting. Uh, there, there's yeah, the mainline kernel. Just edit the the, uh, the 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 distro boot, right? Boot init ramfs, right? I mean, it, like was easy to, to come up. Like it was really trivial without any kernel patches at all, right? Just running mainline six dot six. Was that on? Is that right? Six, no, it's not six. Six dot is it six dot six or six dot three? Now I'm blanking on it. Yeah, six dot six um, is a pretty image on the play it also you boot a mainline master now supports the play out of the box and so that is now in the bookworm feeds so the beagle play is actually running mainline you boot on bookworm all right and so yeah, the I mean, 64 will follow it and rc1 because that just got merged i guess three two from next to master so the next rc1 of you boot will be the the ai64 also switch over yeah, so yeah. running running the builder stuff off of all of the mainline stuff really makes it a lot nicer, right? So the patches are cleaner. I'm not like doing a whole bunch of out of tree patches, right? Just taking everything from upstream, right? So that's pretty close now with with, with Beagle Play, so we can submit it to to build roots. Um, there was some work from a TI guy as well to put the AM62 stuff in there, right? In general, so adding the Beagle Play is going to be pretty pretty yeah. trivial, and. and then, um, and the and speaking of GSOC, a lot of patches, right, for yeah. Zephyr. Yeah. yeah, then also, since we're talking about U-Boot in the Beagle Play, for a GSOC project, the video subsystem does exist. It's just not the encoder for the play. So if someone wants a BIOS screen on the Beagle Play, it just needs the uh, Linux driver. We are sort of one driver away from the Beagle Play having a boot screen, U-Boot, or a Grub, or BIOS, or EFI on startup. Yeah. That is since the last time, it was since the last time we had one of these a beagle cast right we've got the main line we we now have mesa support upstream and a fully open source user space for the gpu on beagle play uh, i think some of the integration bits to kind of demonstrate it for people are still missing but it's there's now a full open source mesa user space for for beagle play gpu the and basic then, like, yeah, tools get the U -Boot efi and like it'll be just like everything mainline opens it's just going to be incredible the dream there nothing to add to that robert and yeah you're talking about the zephyr stuff right so we're getting the mainline zephyr support updated for all those including the the, the gray bus stuff right so been good progress since the last time we talked uh, getting all the kind of the dependent bits for all the gray bus stuff upstream so yeah Still some the gray bus driver there, now it's yeah. like the gray bus driver is mainline so we have that now he's been doing awesome it was a g you know speaking of gsoc students it was another gsoc student that wrote it he's still working on it and he's doing an awesome job pushing stuff the mainline from zephyr to the linux kernel i, yeah, I can always I mispronounce his name oosh yeah he's doing an awesome job yeah and you guys announced click id that's another thing i guess there's, there's just a lot that's gone on in the past in the past little bit so we have a lot of things yeah. to cover <laughs> yeah Let's not be so separated. Like, let's make sure to try to keep our cadence up. Will, yeah, Always stuff going on in Beagle Land. So that'll be yep. another fun one for Beagle Fire: is how many micro bus sections can we put on it? So that way, because each one will have your peripheral dedicated to all the options of micro bus. So how many of those can we fit on a Beagle Fire? Okay, yeah. So funny enough, I have I have a cape, big cape where we have four slots on it, and I'm thinking four slots is just not enough. Like you. Could put a good few more on, on those. So what do we um, have? 38, 40 pins available? Yeah, the like fabric? Just, yeah. Just area-wise, yeah. you could fit at least like sync shuttle ports, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, it just be a meal with all the little shuttle connectors on it. Each mm. one, everything's fully independent, so you get as many I square C or spy devices. Yeah. Put two, put two of the octopus full octopus microbus connectors, and then the rest of the space just fill it with uh, shuttles. I think yeah. you can fill the whole space with shuttles, mm. so I don't know. You imagine like every of those clicks will have its own dedicated PWMs, I squared C spy, UARTs, and a little RIS32 microcontroller to do the communication. And yeah, that might be really nice for like for us to do for like a regression test bench. That's actually a really good idea because we can we can kind of make sure the software is running with all the clicks on one board. So that's actually, yeah, yep, that's actually really interesting. We might be able to have like, you know, if we take you know, five or six of these, you might be able to test like 200 clicks at a time. That's not a bad GSOC idea either. <laughs> yep. Think about the driver mm-hmm. demo. We got 200 different yeah. clicks connected to one Beagle Fire. That's yeah. a very Kai Catable board, so. Yeah, I love it. I'll, I'll implement them. You know, I'll put a bunch of them in my CI over here. Priorities. What do we say no to? We don't yeah. know the definition yeah. of no. That's the problem, yeah. I, I was actually going to ask uh, the, the last couple of weeks, like if... We had a list of clickboards that one would recommend that should really work out of the box to actually test what something similar to what Robert was describing. So that so I could Jason actually. Ha- talk- yeah. So Jason does have a list. It's like 200 some, 300 some that Vishnov had done a few years ago. And mm-hmm. I, I think Deepak worked on some of it too after that. Some of it, but yeah, there's a there's an unofficial list, of all the ones that had worked. Yeah. I think, I think we still yeah, have that yeah. task, Jason, of condensing it to like 10 or something, right? That are. But I like the there's, idea of um, yeah. if we take a Beagle Fire and just have a hundred of them connected, we'll say, "Well, these all work," and just keep on building them. Yeah, oh, there it is. Yeah, so they're the, the Click ID database, the Click Manifest. Okay. Right. Or, so these are the ones that we did manifest. These are older, but this is like I mean, well, they're not. There's there's newer older clicks in here, and I'm just saying we did this a while ago, right? So yeah. there's all of these clicks that we have manifest for files that should just just work with the, the manifests. But as far as the ones that include manifests on them, ID, I gotta pull up that page. And so if you look at ones that have the the the, the, the manifest loaded, what's it's not click ID. Anyway, this is if you have these, it's just a simple one liner to get it. Do you have the link to the microbus page with for click ID? Mm. Click dash ID or click ID? I thought it was just a click, slash click ID one word. Microe.com slash click ID. Oh, it is microbus slash click ID. I don't know how I missed that. Is this, yeah, so there's a whole tutorial here on, there's a video here showing how using click ID with the Beagle Play. And there's also this list of boards that's recommended. Where is it? Yeah, because all new boards coming from them have the ID. So a lot of, you know. Right, but just because they have ID doesn't mean that they have a manifest. And that's the important thing to keep straight. I thought they were here. It might be on the GitHub page. Oh, that's the video. So because there's there's a so the the ID and the and the manifest are not the same thing. So the ID just tells you what the click is. It doesn't have the extra meta information for what drivers to load exactly. Like so, all of the the driver loading information that we provide in the manifest, right? So this this is the manifest. Right. So if you have the manifest, you can get the driver loaded and everything just works. You can store these manifests into those EPROMs. You can you can write them into it so that on next boot, it'll come up. So so there's just an extra step of actually writing it into the EPROM the first time. But there's about 15 or 20 or so that come with the manifests already in them so that when you plug them in, they just boot right up without okay. doing any any manual active at all. And getting that official list, I think our biggest challenge has been who owns that micro or beagle <laughs> mm. right because we both have had there's a dependency from both sides and so neither one of us i think has been like like a thousand percent comfortable right because i say it's their responsibility to publish the list of ones that just work and and you know but but they rely on our software to do that so that's that's the impasse yeah the, the fun thing is micro is so quick on new clicks that a lot of times these exist before there's any linux or even manufactured drivers so they'll have a board spun and ship thousands of them already oh yeah we need a driver for this and so it's kind of a chicken and egg problem they are so quick that there's no driver and then once right. we get a driver we like, can... yeah this is exactly why i'm asking the question yeah uh, because like they they have so many did yeah, and they keep making so many like it's yeah, it's like one every other day. It's constant, yeah. new one, new one, and it's always yeah. new silicon that no one's ever seen before. So, the, my goal is to to teach them to write Linux drivers and submit to them to the mainline. 
ahead of releasing the boards, right? Because they do they do their own software, right? And we've talked about doing a howl to to a lot of, to a big extent, but you know howls don't ever make it into the kernel, right? So you could do something that's compatible with their what, what do they call their software? Um, is it the SDK? Yeah. Yeah, Necto yeah, Studio. The, yeah, the Necto Studio uses it directly. Necto. There's a... Yeah. So, you know, you you could, yeah. So so you could potentially whatever their SDK comes with, you could uh, have a Linux house that you could just run that software as is, but that would never be mainline, right? You have Linux is the abstraction in Linux. So yeah, their Micro uh, SDK two anyway, point they call it. We'll get there, you know, so that all the boards shipping at some point will just automatically run. But for now, if you just write, if you if you buy a board with Click ID and you write the manifest to the EEPROM, it'll boot up and run. And you know, feel free to submit more manifests to us. Yeah, they're not, they're not too, verified yet. too hard, but I think we're we're working on the documenting that that process on how you create a manifest easier. So we need to get back to that, Andre. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I was gonna say. I think I think that that goal of you know at least having a couple that are known to known good pre-flashed plug and play experience, the Q1 goal. So early early Q1, not not Q1, just early. But, you know. Yeah, I've been surprised. Like I had a GNSS device that I plugged in and was like going to try to create the manifest for it. And I realized that the driver was already loaded and running. The manifest was already there. So like the GNS, GNSS 7 click, it just comes up. The, the trickier part is learning how to use GPS and Linux. Yeah. And making sure the PPA signal makes it across. And I mean, PPS signal and tying all the tools with that. Well, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, yeah. One challenge at a time. Won't open that can of worms. Once you get it working, it works great. All right. Well, I guess we can call this episode one. Cyril, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to everyone who's been listening in and everyone watching the video afterwards. See you in two weeks. And BeagleCast is officially back on.